Blackberry is one of the plants that taught me to commune with planets by hanging out with it. There aren't a lot of herbs that can get you in close relationship with Saturn compared to some other planets, and it's nice to have something so delicious that we can spend time with the planet of boundary and time. So I am, I love this plant so much. Hello, and welcome to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast, a show exploring how herbs heal as medicine, as food, and through nature connection. I'm your host, Rosalie de la Forêt. I created this YouTube channel to share trusted herbal wisdom so that you can get the best results when relying on herbs for your health. I love offering up practical knowledge to help you dive deeper into the world of medicinal plants and seasonal living. Each episode of the Herbs with Rosalie podcast is shared on YouTube as well as your favorite podcast app. Transcripts and recipes for each episode can be found at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com or through the link in the video description. Also in the video description, you'll find other helpful resources. For example, to get my best herbal tips, as well as fun bonuses, be sure to sign up for my weekly herbal newsletter. Okay, grab your cup of tea and let's dive in. I first met Meg a few years ago when my bestie gifted me an astrology birth chart reading for my birthday. Prior to that, I had a very minimal understanding of astrology. I knew my sun sign. I know that Virgos are the best. Okay, I'm kidding. Kinda. <laughs> and I remembered that I love reading my horoscope in the paper when I was younger. Well, that first reading with Meg was so insightful. I've since had other sessions with them, and I've gifted readings to my friends, too. Meg's approach to herbalism is infused with their love of herbs, which I think you'll see shine through easily in this conversation. Meg Kane is a consulting astrologer, herbalist, and writer. Their work is rooted in an animist devotional approach that tends to the ties that bind us to each other and to the more than human world. Whether relating to the stars from which we come or to the alive and wise planet that we call home, Meg hopes to bring people into nourishing companionship with the teeming, enchanted world around them. They run Third Sister, an online client practice through which they offer one-on-one -on -one astrology readings and herbal care. You can visit Meg at third-sister.com. Meg, I'm so thrilled to have you here. Thanks for being on the show. I'm so thrilled to be here. Well, what people don't know is that we've actually already been talking for 20 minutes because <laughs> it was all of these things I was excited to chat about. And um, I'm glad we were like, oh, let's do this on the podcast because <laughs> I felt like we just could have kept going and going. But it's such fascinating conversation with you and just really looking forward to what's to come. I am too. Hey, well, I'm curious to hear about your herbal astro path, <laughs> as we might say. Mm -hmm. So I became interested in herbalism. Um, you know, I, I hear stories about people who are herbalists and I get kind of jealous sometimes because they'll talk about how their grandmother taught them or like it's just been in their lives forever. And I just got a cold and really wanted to go on vacation. And the doctor I saw at a walk-in clinic said, take Advil and hope you get better. Um, and I was pissed. <laughs> so I got online and I looked at like home remedies for colds and learned about lemon and honey and garlic. And I got better. And then I was angry for a different reason. <laughs> How come no one had told me about this before? Um, and then I just started learning as much as I could. And here we are with the herbal path. So that's that part. Um, Can I break in right there? Please. Mm -hmm. I, I just love that so much because I often feel like it is just such like so sad that more people don't have that option presented the, to them, the Advil versus the like simple remedies that are already in their kitchen that work really great and don't have the side effects. And 
I can understand like not having the like, oh, the plant spoke to me when I was two years old kind of story. Yeah. But your story is a story that I want to see happening over and over and over. When you think about people just in North America who don't mm -hmm. have any idea about herbs and who could be open to that possibility through something like a simple cold, it just feels like so much potential there. Um, and that's really exciting. So I love that's your story. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like there are people who probably have, um, like through their own, like folk ways have that relationship with a variety of plants, but my parents are both in the more like institutional medicine field so that there was only Dimetap and Robitussin and Dayquil in my house, um, which is one way. Um, but I am really, really grateful to the plants for um, giving me some other options that I can also help other people with. So mm. wonderful. So that kind of got your attention and then you decided to study them more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Formally. And I, I did a few workshops and some online things. And then I don't think I found anything like truly rigorous and in depth until I started studying at um, Commonwealth Holistic Herbalism. And I've done a couple of other programs since, including a mentorship with Sarah Corbett of Rowan and Sage, um, which was incredible. And I continue to learn from her as well. So, but yeah, I just had to get, you know, all the books, too many herbs, bought way too many at the beginning, like not enough that I could know slowly and carefully. I was so excited. And it's been an ongoing journey. You never really stop. So, so true. Mm -hmm. um, with the astrology side, I was interested in astrology, but kind of saw it as a cool personality test until I found um, traditional astrology through Chani Nicholas and then Demetra George and then many, many, many people. I won't just like rattle off the list, but, um, and that just clicked everything into place for me because I, I didn't, um, I should go back. It's important to know that I didn't want to be woo. Like when I was getting into herbalism, I didn't want to get into flower essences. I didn't understand how that could possibly do anything. I wanted to, make sure I was one, I was an herbalist who read scientific studies. I thought that, that that kind of herbalist was very different than the more spiritual herbalist. Like there's completely different. No, and neither, they should never cross. They're never the same person. <laughs> not true. Um, and I also was not interested in astrology except as a tool, like a thing that would tell, you know, these archetypes that would tell us about ourselves ways to like play with who we are. And it took the plants, being so obviously alive and wise and surprising me and changing me for me to realize that this planet is so alive and wise and wild and surprising. And that must mean that the planets out there are too. And that started to just absolutely change my worldview and the mm -hmm. way that I practice. And there's no going back from that that is also very true <laughs> um yeah that's an interesting perspective of just that um yeah going into something with ideas like not wanting to be woo or ideas about what plant medicine is or what's relevant um and then having the actually the process change you yeah, yeah. i think that um, it also reveals in my upbringing and like the culture that I'm raised in a belief that there's only one way to know the truth, that it has to look like lab coats for it to be true. And I don't think that that's not true. Like, I think that is one way we find out what the truth is and it's valid and important. And I don't think we should walk away from it. And there are many others that predate it and live alongside of it. And there's something, I think it is um, 
part of like the oppressive structures that I'm part of that made me think I needed to separate myself from other ways of knowing, like traditional ways of knowing, global ways of knowing that are not opposed to what we think of as like the scientific method and peer reviewed studies, because that's all over the world too. But there's also many, many other ways of like direct experience and spiritual knowing and passing things down through lineages that are at least as valid. And so that also shifted a lot for me ethically, politically, and um, is part of how I ended up not rejecting the so-called woo parts of this work. Mm -hmm. So for, for myself, I've had my own views about astrology change dramatically in, should I say the past three years? Have we been working together? I can't remember, mm -hmm. two or three years now. And so for me, astrology was that um, I knew my sun sign, Virgo all the way. And, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, like I remember as a kid thinking it was like cool and looking in the newspaper to check out my sign. Um, and then that, you know, like, and often that was just like kind of this like vague language that sometimes I'd be like, oh, cool. And sometimes I'd just be like, oh, whatever. Um, and that's kind of like what I thought astrology was, honestly. <laughs> And then um, my bestie, Rebecca, gifted me a birth chart reading with you. And I felt like my whole world changed uh, about like the whole world view of astrology changed in that. And um, so I'm curious if you could talk to that a little bit, because you've mentioned traditional astrology and mm -hmm. just what does that mean? And I think there I'm probably not the only one out there who had this kind of focus on just like, oh, I'm a Virgo. I'll read my horoscope for today and mm -hmm. it's fun and cute. <laughs> it is fun and cute. I think that's great. Um, so I would say there's pop astrology, which is sort of a derogatory term for surface level sun sign based astrology that comes out of basically like newspapers wanting to print horoscopes in the 1930s, I think. Um, wow. But astrology is incredibly old. Like centuries and centuries BCE old, and that's probably older, except that it, that's like the oldest records we have. And so traditional astrology is a uh, imperfect term for describing techniques that we find um, from a Babylonian tradition, Greco-Roman, um, Islamic medieval period. It's, it's like really from the beginning until like all the way through the Renaissance really of like these like sets of traditional practices. Um, I would say medieval and Renaissance also get their own segment. Uh, it's, it's really like trying to break down history into pieces. Modern astrology is a little bit more focused on personality and archetypes and is in, based in a lot of um, psychological thinking which I wouldn't say I don't do. Some people draw really hard lines between the different approaches to astrology. I'm kind of a, a mixed bag, but a lot of my techniques come from the traditional side, which doesn't view the chart only as your personality and like patterns you can have, but also your relationship to the world around you. Different people can actually show up in your chart and also the circumstances of your life are present there as well. And, um, it's not necessarily that you're like where Mars was at the time that you were born only speaks to, I say only, it's still a lot, speaks to like the way that you do anger, but also it can have something to do with specific types of relationships you have in your life as well. So that's one of the differences, but to go into it more, I think might take the whole podcast. <laughs> well, thank you for that. And I think another thing that would be interesting to talk about is that um, currently, my understanding is that astrology and herbalism are seen as separate, but yes. that is not necessarily the case the further we look back. Yeah. So um, I think that it's important to note that astral herbal medicine dates back to at least the 5th century BCE in Babylonian records. I want to say here on this podcast that Nicholas Culpepper, though I adore him, did not make up 
planetary and plant correspondences. Um, it is much older than that. And it goes back to Aristotle's concept of the great chain of being, Al Kindi's theory of cosmic rays, who is, if you don't know Al Kindi, he's an um, Arab Muslim philosopher from the first century CE. And so, like, just by being old doesn't make it correct. But I think um, it's important to note that astrology and herbalism, and really astrology and many things is, uh, you can't actually separate them out historically. They're so interwoven into a, an ongoing, diverse, global conversation of um, metaphysics and like how, like a cosmology, like how does the world even work? And our much beloved constitutional temperament, like temperament theory is also connected to astrology and the four elements and the idea of how the four elements even impact our bodies or are part of who we are. So um, for me, it's interesting to see like where people decide to draw their lines about like what they will include and what they won't include when they think about herbalism or astrology. And it's something that obviously has been a big part of my journey as well from someone who was like, you know, not even willing to consider flower essences. And now I'm uh, reading people's birth charts and talking about how to develop deep relationships with celestial beings out in the firmament. So it's, uh, it's been, um, I understand the, the skepticism that someone might have. And this isn't something that I'm an expert in, but it's interesting to note that other traditions around the world, mm -hmm. whereas Western, what we might broadly call Western herbalism as an imperfect term is, has, you know, separated out these different elements, which are now kind of being reintegrated by people like yourself, um, the astrology, the temperaments, mm -hmm. and the herbs. Whereas mm -hmm. I know in Ayurveda, in certain forms of Chinese medicine, those are still all integrated as a whole. Yeah, It's just kind of in our particular traditions, those have been separated out more. Mm -hmm. Unani medicine as well. There's many, many, many forms where you can see the overlap. Um, I think that part of this, from my perspective, is also that astrology has tried to like has tried to vie for more legitimacy by trying to be a science um, and prove itself as a science. And when it actually has foundations in divination and it being more, at least as connected to magic. And when, and it was about being in connection with the world around us. So that like those plants that pulled me in and, and made it impossible for me to be a rational materialist who could only, who was going to be taken so seriously by the scientific community or something. Um, that spark of strange magic of the green ones is also the strange spark of the sky and how on earth, like the, the wonder we can feel by connecting to all of these things. And when you get into that, some of the way that, that our ancestors, but also like living traditions right now, see the tie between all these things um, becomes a lot clearer and doesn't feel as foggy or confusing. Mm. Well, thank you for all of that kind of sure. lead in and just setting the the scene for us and um i'm excited to hear about the plant you chose blackberry mm. what what called you to to share about blackberry today well one this is season eight of this podcast and i was trying to find something that maybe someone hadn't talked about yet <laughs> but also i love this plant so much and i just love blackberries in general they're one of my favorite foods i mean blackberry and lemon. I'm not sure if it gets more delicious than that from my perspective. Obviously, I have a penchant for sour things. Um, but also, blackberry is one of the plants that taught me to commune with planets by hanging out with it. So um, Cole Pepper, who I'm picking on in this podcast, but I do like him. He <laughs> says that blackberry is ruled by, which is to say stewarded or the child of Venus, which makes good sense. It's part of the rose family. Venus absolutely rules roses. They're both astringent, you know, like the, both, both roses and blackberry, a lot of the, like the, the fruit and then the root and the leaves are all astringent to different 
degrees. And we have that classic five petal flower that's so beautiful, that's also associated with Venus. Um, but I um, I really do think that Blackberry is ruled by Saturn. And I'm happy to talk about some of the medicinal uses of this amazing plant, but if you'll permit me just to my little soapbox about why this is a Saturn plant and not a Venus plant. <laughs> um, I think that the tightening high tannin content of blackberry, if you drink blackberry, which unfortunately as to get into the spirit of this podcast, I drank a ton of it right before this and my mouth is so constricted, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, it is that like binding feeling. And when I spend time with blackberry, I feel a sense of protection, but also it is a hedgerow plant for a lot of people. And that's about boundaries and gateways and thresholds. So I don't think blackberry is necessarily about comfort as much as it's about clarity. And also the, the thorns of the blackberry is they're curved, almost like a scythe, which is a symbol of Saturn. And sheep get caught in blackberry thickets. Then the more they struggle, like the harder it is for them to actually get out. I know we won't go into more detail. It's not pleasant, but that is like a hook to it versus roses goes pretty much straight out. And um, in terms of magic with blackberry, um, it is often that you would you would pa pass someone who is ill underneath like a an archway that, that was made in the bramble and the idea was if the person was sick went through the hedgerow their sickness would get caught in the bramble and they would be free of it so there is this kind of removing quality which is a very saturn type of thing um and there are some other pieces too but i i can talk more about how we work with blackberry but i am so grateful to this plant for um, there aren't a lot of mm, herbs that can get you in close relationship with Saturn compared to some other planets. And it's nice to have something so delicious that we can spend time with the planet of boundary and time. So I am, I love this plant so much. The sense I'm getting from this Meg is that astrology gives you a tool to get to know the plant the plants better and probably vice versa too mm -hmm. but your the things you've described take this you know this awareness of and thinking about like what does that mean um the difference between the thorns between blackberry and rose and the qualities of astringency and what it means to get caught on mm -hmm. something so it's a just an interesting way to have this deeper or um i don't know wider in a sense too understanding of the plants and all that they have to teach us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, um, it, to your point about it going the other way as well, like the, the plants teaching us about the planets. One of the reasons why I really love working with herbalism together with astrology is sometimes astrology can feel a little abstract and heady. Like you look at all these different symbols, it's very overwhelming. And the plant is like, you can taste, touch, grow, tend the plant. It's right there. And to me, the plants bring astrology down to earth. It feels mm -hmm. like you can really, I mean, you can now sip the moon by sipping marshmallow tea. You know, like you can spend time with the sun by sitting with a St. John's wort plant. Mm -hmm. It's just... You can, if you like, feel like, oh, it's really hard for me to get in touch with what exactly Venus is about, eat a strawberry. Hmm. And that the truth is the planets are right here with us all the time, but the plants are such good astrology teachers. Hmm. And that's one of the reasons why I, I, I need, I need that physical grounding. I have a lot of planets in Taurus and Taurus is a very earthy grounded sign. And so for me to do something as, um, you know, way out there as astrology, I need it to feel like something I can touch. So, hmm. um, yeah. Well, what other gifts of Blackberry mm. would you like to share with us today? So many. Okay. So a lot of plants, I think, get like pigeonholed into like, you know, 
this is the herb for that thing. With blackberry, it's just kind of true. Like there are there are some other things blackberry does, but blackberry is so famous for helping us with loose stool and diarrhea. So we're going to talk about poop. Um, and I um, I've actually had quite a few clients in a row recently who've been struggling with loose stools, and um, blackberry has been used this way for so long because of that astringency quality and it has that affinity for the lower digestion. I think that it's also like cooling and so like damp relaxation, damp stagnation, heat excitation. This is like blackberry time. That's that's what you can reach for and it's a vulnerary as well. So topically it can, because of that astringent quality, I would want to work with other plants with it for that, but it's, it has that quality as well. And then it's, the fruits have that blood tonic and antioxidant, plus they're delicious, which is also medicine. Um, but because of the astringency, um, in addition to the sort of lower bowels, there's like sore, swollen throat, mouth ulcers, spongy gums, the wet, phlegmy cough, the leaky, boggy, allergy-like symptoms. Um, for again, lower GI, I think with yarrow for hemorrhoids too, we can see that. Um, and I know that my teachers over at Commonwealth Herbalism talk about tincturing blackberry root in red wine to like double up on the tannin content, which I've never done, but for like acute diarrhea situations, like if you were going traveling or something, um, I can imagine that being so helpful. Um, Rosalie, I know that in one of your books, you talk about blackberry and raspberry a little bit. I'm wondering mm -hmm. like what kind of relationship you have with blackberry, if any. Uh, well, I love blackberry so much. It was um, in some ways my my foray into wild foods. Oh, wow. And, yeah. So I have that connection too. that. I just have a lot of gratitude for Blackberry showing the way. And um, yeah, definitely everything you said about the that's like that tightening and toning quality. What I was struck by what you were saying, Meg, is that, you know, yes, Blackberry has this like, you know, it does that one thing really well. Mm -hmm. But because it does that one thing really well, astringency, tightening and toning, we have all of these applications for it, like you just shared from um, tightening the bowels and addressing loose stools to any kind of like drippy, stagnant, um, swollen kind of thing, like blackberry is there for us. And I love that blackberry isn't overkill. You know, like it has astringency yeah. and it's, it's got a good amount of astringency, but it's not too strong and it's, it's not, not too oak. Weak. Yeah. Yeah. It's not oak. <laughs> um, and uh, which is going to be on the podcast this season as well. Oh, so either, I'm not sure if it has been or it will be um, necessarily, but um, yeah, two astringent herbs. Blackberry is that, um, yeah, it just has that perfect amount. I didn't learn this until looking at some, um, indigenous to the United States or the so-called United States uses of blackberry. Um, also, I didn't know there were 375 species of blackberry, which is, I guess, not that surprising, but like, okay, wow. Um, but the Cherokee people um, also, in addition to hemorrhoids and sore throat, um, have a history of using blackberry for swollen joints, especially found in like rheumatoid arthritis. And I thought that was really interesting because of the diuretic um, effect of blackberry. And also the idea of sort of just like, I think of astringency a lot with like mucous membranes or skin, but there's also that kind of pulling out of excess fluid of the diuretic. So mm. it's just continuously having that impact of, are things feeling boggy or leaky? Let's tone that up. Let's secure that structure. Let's shore up the, mm -hmm. like what this is, um, what the boundaries of this part of the body are meant to look like, which again, Culpepper, that sounds like Saturn, but okay. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's the fruit, which, you know, is like this kind of this juicy, you know, it's just this so other good. aspect of this medicine that... Um, and it makes, you know, for joint pain and stuff, I think about the fruit as being this like incredibly phytonutrient rich mm -hmm. uh, fruit that could help modulate inflammation, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The, the root too is, um, 
has some antimicrobial qualities too. So that astringent um, element topically can also be like a really good wound wash. I think there are other herbs that you might have like more on hand for that kind of thing, but it's nice to know the breadth of it. Also, um, another indigenous use, which was across so many nations, I didn't write them down, but um, eye wash, which makes so much sense for like swollen eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does make a lot of sense. And so we've talked about some gifts of blackberry mm -hmm. and you've shared a tea recipe with us. Yes. Saturn's bramble tea. Yes. And I'd love to hear more about the inspiration for this tea. The inspiration for this tea is that um, I want to encourage people to get to know plants and planets together. And when that's the case, I like to keep things really, really simple. Cause if you throw a plant, you're trying to get to know into a complex formula, it's not always easy to identify which part mm -hmm. is which. And so, um, if you just want to get to know blackberry, I recommend making a tea of the leaves, um, and just starting there, but the, to make it somewhat of a formula and also to give a kind nod to my friend Nicholas. Um, this is blackberry leaf, one teaspoon, one teaspoon of rose. Still very simple. A little bit of Saturn, a little bit of Venus, a little rose family in a cup. And um, if you are someone who leans towards dryness so that that astringent quality might not feel really comfortable, you could always add a little bit of plantain leaf to that as well. Hmm. And yeah, I would just keep it to the two cups of water, steep for 10 minutes, enjoy. Maybe on a Saturday, Saturn days are uh, ruled by Saturn. So astrology is everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Thank you for sharing that recipe. You're so welcome. Are there other ways you like to enjoy uh, blackberry? Oh, just like eating the berries right out of anything. <laughs> so good. Um, yeah. I also will say I don't recommend having the root that often because the high tannin content can be really drying. However, there is this light bit of vitamin C type of citrus flavor that comes through the root that mm -hmm. I think is absolutely delicious. Um, so it's got like a black tea plus a lemon peel type of flavor to it. Hmm. Lovely. Thanks for sharing that tip too. Of course. <laughs> Well, we've shared a lot about blackberry, its uh, associations with Saturn, its uh, gifts, and um, the way it just from being in the world with its thorns and uh, as well as its medicinal properties. Is there anything else you'd like to share about blackberry before we mm. move on? Um, one of my favorite images, um, of blackberry is from so um the herbalist and many other things polymath dioscorides uh wrote an essential materia medica in the early it was like basically like fifth between 50 and 70 ce in what is now contemporary turkey and his writing was reproduced in many languages across history, but there is a gorgeous illustrated copy of it made in the sixth century in Constantinople. And it contains my very favorite like botanical illustration of Blackberry. And it so emphasizes all of the like brambling thorns that go up the side of the page. And I'll, I'll have to, I'll have to share it with you so it can maybe be popped into the, the video. Yeah, we definitely can put that on for those of us on YouTube watching this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lovely. Well, Meg, I'd love to hear what kind of herbal offerings and things that you have going on right now. Yeah, so I have a newsletter, which is not really a newsletter because I don't share a lot of news. I share very long essays about plants and planets, and um, that is a free mailing list. And then in the same place, I also open up my like early access to my booking calendar where I see clients one-on-one -on -one for herbal consults, but also for astrology readings. And my very, well, 
I can't say it's my favorite. I have a couple of favorites, but one of my absolute favorite offerings to do is something called plant and planet devotion, which has to do with this thing we've been talking about this whole episode, which is the way that we bridge between what is right here on earth and is what is out there when we look up at the night sky. And um, it's really about connecting to one planet in your chart. It can be the sun, but there are a bunch of others and um, really getting to know it so well as much as we can in a short period of time. And then an herbal ally that can help you get to know that planet even more and that that planet can teach you about that herb. So um, yeah, I really, I really love that particular offering. Mm, it's a beautiful offering. And I want to chime in and say that I love your newsletter <laughs> and um, those essays are beautiful. I uh, one of my favorites was the one you wrote about the will willow and the moon. Oh, it was so yeah. beautiful. Um, but everyone, you know, there's insights there that just in your own way of clarity and groundedness, combining these different elements together is just always insightful. So highly recommend your newsletter. Thank you. Yeah. And before I let you go, Meg, I'd like to ask you the question I'm asking everybody in season eight, which is mm -hmm. what has been one of your most important herbal mistakes? I am sure there are others. There have to be. But the one that comes to mind immediately is when I was first getting started, like really, really early. And I was putting in my first um, like dried herb order. And I got, I love mythology so much. And I love folklore and I love fairy tales. And I, uh, Artemis has been a really important figure to me for a long time. And I saw that there was this plant that was Artemisia something. So, and I had no idea what amount of herb to get of anything. And I got a pound of wormwood. And then I made a, a mason jar amount of a tincture of it, having never tasted it before. And when I finally strained it and had it, I realized what a horrible mistake I had made um, because wormwood is a wonderful plant, but you do not for personal use need that much ever. So that's, that's the one that comes to mind immediately. Mm, that's a very important herbal mistake <laughs> that I think a lot of us, our enthusiasm can sometimes lead the more thoughtful uh, qualities of either gathering or purchasing herbs and yeah yeah and it's a mistake I've made and I'm not proud of it and uh, I did, I talked about it also at the um, onset of this season when I talked about my most important herbal mistakes but it's one I hear a lot of herbalists make and I think it's so important to talk about it because the more we can prevent other people from making that same mistake the better yeah I yeah. think part of what you said too about like being, um, there's an excitement. And I think every time I slow down as an herbalist or an astrologer, just as a person, it's better. Um, it's, better. <laughs> it's just better. And yeah. I also think it helps me, um, you know, like do a little bit more research, just tilt your head slightly and, and see a different perspective. And, um, it keeps me from grab bagging it, you know, which can be, mm -hmm really tempting to do so mm -hmm. yeah. yeah well thank you so much for sharing your most important herbal mistake <laughs> as well as all of this wisdom regarding astrology and blackberry and plants <laughs> thank you for having me this was lovely yeah so lovely thanks for being here thanks for being here don't forget to head over to the show notes at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com to download your beautifully illustrated recipe card and get a transcript of this show. There you'll also be able to sign up for my weekly newsletter, which is the best way to stay in touch with me. You can also visit Meg directly at third-sister.com. If you'd like more herbal episodes to come your way, then one of the best ways to support this podcast is by subscribing on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. I deeply believe that this world needs more herbalists and plant-centered folks and I'm so glad that you're here as part of this herbal community. Also, a big round of thanks to the people all over the world who make this podcast happen week to week. 
Nicole Paul is the project manager who oversees the whole operation from guest outreach to writing show notes to actually uploading each episode and so many other things I don't even know. She really holds this whole thing together. Francesca is our fabulous video and audio editor. She not only makes listening more pleasant, she also adds beauty to the YouTube videos with plant images and video overlays. Tatiana Rusikova is the botanical illustrator who creates gorgeous plant and recipe illustrations for us. I love them. I know that you do too. Christy edits the recipe cards and then Jenny creates them as well as the thumbnail images for YouTube. Michelle is the tech wizard behind the scenes and Karen is our student services coordinator and customer support. For those of you who like to read along, Jennifer is who creates the transcripts each week. Xavier, my handsome French husband, is the cameraman and website IT guy. It takes an herbal village to make it all happen, including you. Thank you so much for your support through your comments, your reviews, your ratings. I read every review that comes in because they're like a little herbal love letter that brightens my day, like this one. As someone who's been working with plant medicine and wild foods for decades, I still love listening to Rosalie's perspective. Try her recipes and don't miss an episode. Do you love this podcast? If you leave a review for me on Apple Podcasts, I may be reading your herbal love letter on the show next. Okay, you've lasted to the very end of the show, which means you get a gold star and this herbal tidbit. Well, I mentioned in the interview that blackberry was one of my first foraged plants, so I thought I would share about that. I was living in Seattle at the time and I was with friends at a park and we came across a bramble with ripe blackberries and we started to eat them. We then filled up a bag and we brought all of those blackberries home with us and we made cobbler. This was well before I was an herbalist or even a plant person. To date, that was the best tasting cobbler I've ever had. And that entire experience of harvesting food with my own hands, being in community, and sharing the bounty created a shift in me that continues to unfold today. <laughs>